Welcome everyone to this panel in our Barbara Carkaby Living Archive series sponsored by the Friends of Women's Studies and the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program here at the University of Houston. It's co-sponsored by the Class Special Committee on Race and Social Justice and the UH Asian American Studies Center. I'm Elizabeth Gregory, Director of the WGSS Program and the UH Institute for Research on Women, Gender and Sexuality. The Living Archive series aims to present a sense of the complex history of women's lives in Houston and the Friends support the WGSS program with scholarships, fellowships, and much more. Today's topic also intersects with the concerns of our Yayen Lee endowment, which is focused on the experience and needs of refugee women in the Houston area. Our topic today is anti-Asian racism and sexism, responding to both the recent murder of six women of Asian descent in Atlanta on March 16th, and to the 150% rise in anti-Asian reported hate incidents, many of them violent, that has occurred in the US since the start of the pandemic in the context of the racist language utilized by the former administration. 3,800 incidents were recorded in the last year and many more went unrecorded. 68% of those were against women more than double those against men. We are privileged to have a distinguished panel here today to discuss the current dynamics and the background against which they, the background against which they occur. And I will now introduce our moderator who will introduce the panelists. Professor Shepa Masango Shari is, the South, is a South African scholar specializing in African history with a focus on racial formation, radical politics and religious expression. Her research connects African radicalism with black nationalism in the US and she writes on gender, sexuality and violence as well. She is well positioned to explore the issues raised by our topic today. Professor Sherry, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gregory. It is my honor to welcome all of you here today to discuss uh, anti-Asian hate and sexism. I have a distinguished group of panelists, and I will very briefly offer you introductions. However, I urge you all to take a moment and look in the chat for um, a larger biography that you can um, get a sense of where each of these panelists are coming from. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Debbie Chen Esquire, the Civic Engagement Programs Director of OCA Greater Houston. Deborah Y. Chen is an immigration attorney at the law offices of Deborah Y. Chen and Associates and a longtime community activist for more than 20 years. She serves on the board of OCA Greater Houston Chapter, where she co-founded the Houston AAPI Film Festival Committee and co-organizes OCA Greater Houston Advocacy Center's monthly citizenship workshops, uh, pro bono legal resource uh, guide, as well as a biannual National Asian Pacific American Elections Exit Survey that Houston cites. Please look on our chat section for more information. In addition, I'd like to welcome Dr. Liz uh, Yu Chow, who is a clinical investigator uh, who has maintained continuous funding from the NIH since receiving a Mentored Career Development Award from the National Cancer Institute in 2006. She has a myriad of interests and I'm sure that we will cover them to a certain extent in our discussion today. However, I'll just raise a few that she does work and research on HIV related immunosuppression on, cancer, on the cancer incidence of HIV infected individuals. She also addresses poor cancer outcomes and HIV infected individuals um, along with um, HPV related cancers. Next, I'd like to welcome Professor Karen Fang. Karen Fang is a professor in the Department of English, the chair for the University of Houston's class initiative in media and moving image and contributes to the uh, engines of our ingenuity and NPR program on culture and human creativity. Karen Fang is a film scholar and critic who writes about the intersection of Eastern aesthetics in global culture. Her most recent book, I think will, is very timely to our discussion, which is Arresting Cine Cin Cinema, Surveillance in Hong Kong Film. That's by Stanford University Press 2017. It looks at scenes of social and spatial, as well as data monitoring in Hong Kong. 
And of course, last but not least, I would like to introduce you to Professor Yali Zong. She is a professor of education, leadership and policy studies and the university endowed professor for global leadership studies. She is also the director of University of Houston's Asian American Studies Center, which she established in 1995. Her research includes cross-cultural, transnational understanding, ethnic identity formation, and minority student academic achievement. There is so much more that I could say about each of these panelists, but I'm sure you'll get a sense of who they are as we begin our discussion. Before we start our discussion, I do want to mention to all of you the format. I plan on posing a question and then having all of our panelists res respond accordingly. And um, what we hope is that this will be a roundtable, an opportunity for an initial discussion about issues that really we have been waiting to have in full display here at the University of Houston, of course, in our city, Houston, and beyond. So I'll begin um, with this question. Given this sort of history of Asian violence and racism in the US and this killing um, as one example against a background of increased violence and aggression against Asian Americans, how can we understand the role of xenophobic rhetoric um, contributing to this? And I'll open the floor to any, any one of you. I think we'll start with Yali. Please make sure to unmute your mic. We'd love to hear all that you have to offer us. Thank you. I think uh, there are several factors that have contributed to this search. Uh, one is that US has more than 200 years old history of asking exclusionary policy and uh, practice. And discrimination, hate language, and hate crimes against AAPIs. The history of victory and the xenophobia in the US especially contribute to this rise in anti-Asian violence and hate. The second factor is the introduction and the assumption around the term modern minority during the civil rights movement, which forcefully suggests that the Asian American are more successful than other ethnic minorities, that they are studious, you know, law abating and the upwardly moving group. So this myth became an obstacle to the social justice movement as far as AAPIs were concerned and the hindered advancement of active for Asian Americans. The third factor is you, the use of racist rhetoric by some politicians to describe COVID-19 virus, the Chinese virus, the Kung Fu, exacerbated a situation in which all racial ethnic groups were already feeling vulnerable and fearful of this contagious virus. Racist rhetoric incited discrimination and ignited violence about you know, PP, uh, AAPI. Just stop here. So, you know, to echo what Dr. Zhou just said, um, racism and xenophobia against the Asian community has always been there, right? Um, from the beginning of this country. Uh, you know, there were Asian Americans here in the Civil War, we, we don't know about that. And that goes back to the fact that our general education system, uh, our history books don't really talk about the contributions of minorities, you know, other than, you know, a few paragraphs. I mean, there was a controversy just a few years ago, right, where, 
you know, African American slaves were described as workers. And you might have one sentence in a book about how the Chinese built the railroad, but not nothing about how, um, you know, historically Asian Americans have been uh, used or pitted against other ethnic groups. Right, so in the 1800s, you know, we were called literally the um, model minority race in the sense that uh, Chinese workers, you know, worked too hard. They worked so hard that it was unfair for white workers to be able to compete against them. And so that was actually used as a basis to enact these blatant racist discriminatory laws um, restricting you know, Chinese workers from being able to live in certain places or work in certain industries. Uh, there are land laws in this country that still exist on the books that you know, Chinese or Asians are not allowed to own land. Um, most people don't realize that you know, the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act came about as a result of basically an agreement between politicians in the West and politicians in the South saying, well, it's okay for you to discriminate against you know, the Chinese and you know, all subsequent Asian groups who came in, there were different laws enacted for them. Um, it's okay for you to you know, murder and kill and discriminate against them. But at the same time, then you're gonna keep your mouth shut about the Jim Crow laws in the South and, you know discrimination and murdering uh, an entire race of, you know, African-Americans. Like these are just examples of that intersectionality of how our communities of minorities have been historically pitted against each other or used against each other. And that continues to this day through the sixties with, you know, the model minority myth where we are basically used as a wedge against other groups. We are drawn as humans to identify differences between um, you know, ourselves and our tribes. And for, uh, it's just um, that this visual difference is linked so closely um, with, with uh, disease and, um, and, and discrimination, it, you know, sort of it's, it's an ongoing um, thread through definitely through US history. And I imagine probably through other um, uh, countries where there's a, a long history of, of Asian immigration, Australia um, and other, other countries where Asians have immigrated from. Um, but, but this particular moment in, um, in terms of COVID is I think uh, sort of a perfect storm, an unfortunate coincidence of events um, that uh, this particular virus did arise, well, was first detected, I should say, um, in China. But again, this whole class of viruses has been around for several decades. And, um, you know, and had this been MERS, what would have happened if this, if MERS had been the virus that had caused the global pandemic? Again, um, you know, would, you know, there would be scapegoating again for uh, for probably you know people from the middle east um so so it's 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 sort of like a kind of a perfect storm of um the historical um and the geographic geographical and political um uh you know intersectionality and i'm sure we'll continue discussing public health in some form or fashion right in in some ways um, this is what has allowed us to have this virtual event. Um, but I do want to pick up on the thread that all of you have talked about, this kind of stereotyping um, that has lended itself to this kind of violence. And I'm curious about how you see um, in this anti-Asian violence. Is it part of the same kind of violence that we're seeing um, against Black and Hispanics? Or is it different? You know, what's the distinction there that we can make? And can you also help us understand the gender component that we just saw in this the past Atlanta shootings? Um, I'll wait into that. Uh, it's multifaceted, right? Uh, because of the stereotypes of you know the exoticism of of and the fetishes of of uh, Asian American women. I think that contributed to, you know, just violence against women overall, 
right? It's just, this was the, the way to target Asian women specifically or Asian Americans um, that uh, contributed to you know, what happened in Atlanta. But overall, I think Asian American women, because there's a stereotype of them being more, you know, quiet or smaller or docile that makes them more likely to be profiled even as, you know, uh, victims of crime, whether it even rises to the legal definition of a hate crime, right? Um, and then you, you look at how violence has happened against other minority communities and you could, you could th theoretically extrapolate and say, you know, for the different types of violence that other communities experience on a regular basis that many Asian Americans um, experience similar things, um, but maybe for a different stereotype, right? Like many years ago in you know California, I, I'm I'm just blanking out on the name of the exact case right now. You know, a man came out of his house holding a broom and was shot to death by police claiming, well, they were afraid that he was going to attack them with Kung Fu, right? Um, there are, you know, in California, especially, you know, for a long time where uh, Asian American men were profiled for driving in rice rockets. And so because they were driving around in rice rocket, like, you know, those fancy little souped up cars, um, they were, you know, potentially a, a gang member. Uh, is it as, as prevalent and widespread compared to the African-American community? No, simply because we don't have the same demographic numbers, but is it the same you know, basis on, on race and stereotypes? Absolutely, right? There's you know, two cases right now where you know, the, this is a struggle within the Asian-American community around law enforcement. And it's, you know, it's on both ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, you know, there are many people in the Asian American community who feel that, you know, we need protection. You know, who, who is going to speak up for us or protect us or step in if not the law enforcement? But then at the same time, you have, you know, instances like, you know, what I just you know, pointed out of law enforcement who may not have, frankly, the same resources or training that was made available about, you know, community, you know, enforcement or community policing or just understanding cultural biases and differences that we all hold or understanding, you know, mental health issues, right? There are cases in all communities where people who have mental health challenges Right, their families call 911 or call the police because they need help. And, and then it ends up where because there's miscommunications, there's lack of training, there's misunderstanding about what mental health really is, someone ends up being shot and killed. Right. And there are cases like that in all of our communities. So it's it's hard for me to say definitively that there are hate crimes happening against you know an Asian American versus an African American or a Latin American that is completely different when they actually have this underlying thread it's just the the, the biases are different yeah I think um another way of sort of specifically t focusing on this issue today's panel issue about sort of like um violence racism and, um, and, and our re respective populations or, or, or race groups in America, right? And what is the relationship or the difference, the comparison contrast between say the African racism, the racial experience of African-Americans in particularly in terms of its intersection with crime and the law and how uh, Asian-Americans, right? And so I think if, if we sort of talk in experiential terms, like I think um, the African-American writer, Tenezi Coates, has written about, you know, he has written about an experience that I think I understand many African American parents sort of talk about as like the talk, the talk that you have to have with your young son about, you know, your visibility, your hyper visibility, because you're always going to be the one who's suspected. Like you have to be extra good because people are always going to suspect you of something, even if you aren't actually doing anything. And you have to be, you know, when a, when a cop pulls you over, don't do, you know, do all of these things. Like African-Americans, right? 
the particular way in which like their historical racial experience becomes like visualized and objectified in one particular body in terms of the law and the vulnerability of the body is particularly the, the vulnerability of the African-American male body before the law, right? And the, the law is like, will to control or to exercise this power over that body. For Asian Americans, right, it's slightly different. As you pointed out, like we are often objectified through our, through our women, not through our men. And the stereotype is that we're weak, we're frail, we're submissive, and we're available sexual objects, right? And so, you know, Asian Americans, Asian American parents didn't, never had to worry necessarily about vulnerability to the law and vulnerability to violence, right? We maybe had to worry about the fact that we wouldn't be considered like the law wouldn't listen to us or attend to us in the same way right we you know asian americans as a as a group don't report crimes against themselves you know as much as any other racial group right you know all, but what's been interesting i mean a terrible thing that's consequence of our historical moment now is now our bodies are starting to look like African-American bodies, right? Because now we're targets of violence. But like in the case of the Atlanta shooting, right? The, 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 our, the bodies that were like, you know, the, the victims of that tragedy were tragedy, were, 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 they were victims because of, you know, arguably this history of sexualized objectification. And, and, and the violence I would add also against, in the tragedy against this woman, is not only that they were killed, but that people can't take it seriously, right? By saying it was, you know, he the killer had a bad day or, you know, simply accepting the explanation of sex addiction as a motivation, you know, or, or you know, extenuating, you know, circumstance or, or, or context for the killing. Okay, I really agree with uh, Dr. Fang and that Tony Chen's statement. Obviously, there's violence against Asian Americans, but maybe like both of them discuss a different way, in a different way. Uh, some people in this society, because has, uh, have not recognized the racial issues against the Asian Americans. And uh, sometimes Asian Americans keep silent, uh, you know, when they are mistreated, are mistreated. But this time, there's not enough, enormous evidence to show the violence, discrimination, aggression against Asian, Asian women, Asian Americans. I just, there's so many data there, but I want to use our own research to show that because recently we have a research conducted by our doctor students sponsored by Asian American study. Our doctor students like Rosa Na, Ivy Bachman, Christian Landman, to study about university student realized experience. So in the study among 2015 responses, 83% indicated that it is more common for people to express racist view against AAPI during the COVID-19 pandemic than before. 88% reported there has been an increase in hostility towards Asian Americans because of COVID-19. 45% respondents reported experience other individual acting uncomfortable around them. So students also report being invalidated for their collectivistic values. In most cases, students didn't defend themselves when they were made fun of because they fear of their safety and the repercussions. And decently, uh, high numbers of uh, Asian female reported being stereotypes as freaks in bed. 
So you just think in last uh, years, like 68% of incident against Asian women compared with 29% uh, involving men. So sadly, we see so many people just were killed and hurt it. So it's time for our society to recognize this anti-Asian violence and speak out, discuss the issues like today we discuss. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to add to this conversation, this very fruitful conversation about the ways in which Asian women are being presented, right? The, so this notion of the submissive and sexualized um, Asian woman, and sometimes we see this and we've seen this in film. So the world of Susie Wong, Miss Saigon, uh, and in a different light, I think the Crazy Rich Asians, which is one of the more recent films, and so what I am hoping that you can help us understand perhaps is a transgenerational discussion because as we've had this increase in violence, 68% of the people who are reporting the kind of microaggressions, harassment, violence have been women. So this stands in some kind of contradiction, right? Between what is portrayed and what is actually happening in terms of moving our needle and understanding anti-Asian hate. So can you all um, weigh in and comment on that? Um, since it's about film, I should just, <laughs> probably start this off. So, you know, um, so there's, there's films from the 50s, The World of Susie, China Doll, like uh, Flower Drum Song. A lot of that was a sort of direct response to American foreign policy at the time. So America was um, interested in expanding uh, pro expanding and protecting their sphere, sphere of influence in Asia. And so, the, and, and also remember, they also had a ho whole population of servicemen who had returned from the Pacific theater. And, you know, and during the World War II had been encouraged to seek R&R in places like Hong Kong you know, and they were familiar with sort of comfort women and, you know, and, and so there was, you know, there was an experiential, there's, there's experiential um, no, notions of Asian sexuality that had entered into American discourse, like, I mean, had been re revived during World War II, right? Because that, that had also been in place, again, during the exclusion era when there were brothels, you know, in the Chinatowns because exclusion pro pro prohibited women from coming to the US. And so they would, so the Chinese businesses would import women and, and there would be these brothels in Chinatown that served both white and Chinese men. But it becomes particularly like the sexualization of Asian women, I should say, becomes sort of like domesticated and naturalized in a highly visible way at mid-century for large, partly because of like it's it's consistent with American foreign, foreign policy. And so over and over again, you see these films at these times that repeatedly show a white man, usually played by William Holden in um, World of Susie Wong, right? Um, you know, seducing a, an Asian woman who falls for him, right? And this is sort of a, a, like an, a, a, a romance of American expansionism, right? And because it's given this Hollywood gloss, it becomes, it seems like it, 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 it's um, a natural, it becomes a naturalized discourse. It seems um, desirable, right? And one of the reasons why Asian women, you know, are often seen sexualized, um, are seen as sort of like highly sexualized. It's not only because there's this long like material history that validates that, but also because in sort of like, you know, heteronormative longstanding notions of what is considered like attractive in Western discourse, right? Like thin, you know, small, soft-spoken, hairless, right? All of those attributes that are like, have, have been like valorized as, sex as sexually attractive in the global media, right, are attributes that Asian women, you know, phenotypically fulfill, <laughs> right? So, so when you when you you lump in sort of you know historical like historical legacies, phenotypic attributes, right, a population for cultural and demographic and legal reasons who don't seek, you know, who who don't fight back and seek re representation and. Um, or are seen to be as such, and a, politic, a geopolitical discourse that also corroborates that, right? It's very difficult, you can imagine, to see Asian women as not, you know, outside of that stereotype that's being presented. And so, so that's sort of 
you know, those are the predecessors for, for the uh, moment that we're in today. The, the question about something like um, crazy rich Asians, I think is really interesting because like Asian, the Asian body in global media has really changed in the past 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, Asians, Asian bodies are almost like one of the least represented racial groups in the um, in global media, and particularly in Hollywood, which still um, re largely remains the sort of most influential media form, right? So Asian stars and actors have the least number of lines, like, you know, in, um, Asian characters are the Asian characters get the least number of lines if they appear at all, right? In in mainstream media, right? They're always the sidekick, you know, or you know, at best, like they're never the star, right? It has started to change only because of the global power, economic power, clout of China, and in fact, right now China is funding the major is is the most lucrative source of media in the world right now, and so Crazy Rich Asians, you know, was intentionally created um, on the part of its maker, a former UH creative writing grad, you know, who's very, and very transnational, very sophisticated, very, you know, that he was, he's a member of this new sort of transnational elite. He, you know, he knew that he was trying to represent a different side of Asian America. Um, he knew that it was going to uh, meet, re, meet, meet uh, have available to him a different like media market at the time that it was coming out, right? And, you know, certainly we see that in its success, but, you know, its star, Constance Wu, is very um, active on social media and she's been quite um, vehement throughout her startup about sort of the question, issue of Asian American representation. And so, you know, I think we have a far, we, we have far to go, right? We, Asian Americans in global media, in Western media still don't command, the like time on screen or the investment or the, you know, as um, as African-Americans or even Latino stars, right? You know, and especially considering the fact that African-Americans or Asian-Americans like, you know, have higher disposable income and the most educated, you know, racial group in America, right? Why don't we have a media representation commensurate to that? It's starting to, the needle is starting to move, but, you know, obviously it hasn't moved enough. I have a question for you, Karen, about that. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, is that because, um, you know, maybe Asian Americans don't spend their income on, you know, <laughs> film, right? Like maybe there's a way that, um, that um, they, they've, uh, that, that we as a group have come to understand that we are you know, that that's not, that's not our, our role or that's not, um, you know, that we don't, we don't, you know, spend our money in ways that entertain and sort of, nor you know, in terms of like other, you know, people or, and or our family values or, you know, I'm just curious that, you know, I wonder if there's that even though we have um, a lot of spending ability, if that doesn't somehow uh, either, again, the invisibility issue, right? Is it because they are, we're actively being um, excluded or is it, is it partly also that, you know, again, we're, we're, we're just not, we're not vocal, you know, we don't, you know, there's not a lot of act, you know, in terms of, I imagine that there are fewer people going into media. Um, I, you know, I just, I'm curious about those kind of statistics. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can I can have an answer to that, and I also want to turn it back around to you because I have a version of it that I think is perfect for you. Um, so yeah, I mean, the reason why the needle is starting to to change, I think, is be precisely because I mean, it's generational change. The the geopolitical, the global balance of power has changed, as I as I alluded to earlier. So I think these early, the older generations of Asian Americans, they may have had the income, but they didn't spend the money, as as Liz points out, because you know. It, it, you, you didn't have a lot of choices back then. You know, if you were like, when I was growing up in the 70s and the 80s, like I was gonna watch the Cosby show or um, I don't know what else, like um, the one with the girls, you know, the facts of life, <laughs> right? You know, like that's what was available to me. If I, if I was gonna wait around for something that like represented me, I was never gonna have anything to watch on TV, right? But it's, you know, but now, you know, there you you start to have more people who are demanding something that looks like them, right? And you also have a sort of industry 
that's more aware of the clout of these, you know, not only the consumers, but also the financiers, right, which is the point that I, was, I had made previously as well. And so you see this, and also like the, the nature of media has changed. So now it wasn't, it's no longer broadcasting, there's a lot of narrow casting. So in YouTube, right, um, there, you know, Asian Americans coincidentally, you know, t tend to be, you know, unusually re highly represented amongst like the YouTube generation, right? And and so certainly that's, you know, so we, we start to see these changes. And I think that, you know, hopefully that will, that the, mo the, dial the move of the dial will continue. But the, the, what I wanted to say to you, Liz, about in terms of reversing or a version of this question is I think, you know, one of the contexts or one of the insights of, I think, the media example that I'm familiar with Right, is basically what you're asking about is people don't change unless they ha unless they see their own interest, right? Like, um, you know, the like still white Hollywood, which is still predominant white, you know, the power still, you know, power still mostly resides among the white establishment, right? Like there are huge inroads on the parts of other kinds of like populations and major players who are no longer who are not like white or male. Right, but it's still you know the, the majority majority still remains within the white establishment. But like, the how do you make change happen until like the establishment sees that it's in their interest to change, right? So that, that's why media has changed, right? Become more inclusive, become more diverse, right? Because they see the how their the how it can help their bottom line. And I think you know like when we get to go back to the specific issue about the moment that we're in right now with anti Asian race, racism, right? I mean, you know, the irony of the whole like infection Chinatown, Chinatown disease discourse that is so long lasting and that was revived during the pandemic, right, is that actually, right, didn't the Chinatowns, you know, throughout North America have lower rates of community spread and infection, right, you know, you know, and I think, and one of the reasons why people think that is, is partly because you know, they obviously, you know, we're all embedded in transnational networks through our relatives, right? And through different language news media, like Dr. Zove can probably talk about, right? You know, and so there was, and there was a sort of awareness and early prevention, right? Um, you know, and familiarity with SARS and bird flu and swine flu, right? And so, you know, and so ironically, there's two points about sort of like trans, like the effect of transnationalism and why, the rest of us should change because of it, right? It's because it like it's in your own interest for public health, right? For future profits, right? To be aware of like what's going on, right? To, to be insular, to be um, within your American silo, your white establishment silo doesn't serve that establishment anymore. It endangers you in terms of public health and, and you, you lose out on the bottom line. And that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, I think that you know, if you think about it in terms of transnationalism and um, and and disease in general, um, you know, uh, there's a you know, Asian people have the longest like longevity in the U.S. Um, and um, so there, you know, that um, and and like you said, our, our, a lot of our networks we knew early on that this was going to be and took precautions early on. Um, that um, and so right, like in the Chinatowns, there was definitely um, lower um, spread. But you know, the interesting, the other interesting thing is that you know there there are data to suggest that even though we you know we may want to become trans and transnational and more open. I think it's very difficult, right? And I think the opposite actually ends up happening, which right. is that we end up looking more like the insular American. And I'm, I'm just gonna show a couple of slides that are related specifically to health. Um, and um, um, so um, there was a recent article um, from the Annual Review in Public Health um, that shows, um, hold on, that they looked at, um, particularly, oh, hold on, particularly, uh, Asian, um, women and men and sort of what their, um, their life expectancy look like. I'm sorry, I didn't put the first slide in, but it basically shows that everybody's life expectancy increases till about 2015. 
And then everybody's life expectancy plateaus basically in the U. This is all U.S. So this is um, in the U.S. And you can see then what they did was they they divided it by year, um, um, how much of a change that um, occurred between 2014 and 2017 in terms of the, um, the, the mortality, right? So negative means that there was more mortality and then positive means there was less mortality. So for every, for every gender and for every race, there was overall more mortality from 2014 to 2017. And even though, you know, in if the sort of overall life expectancies of Asian men and women um, increased uh, in general and were the highest in general, we still saw the same amount of decline in, or increase, I'm sorry, increase in mortality, decline in life expectancy. So we're becoming more like, um, you know, our insular US. And then one other thing I wanted to draw attention to is, this slide, which really st struck me, this is age-adjusted death rates for suicides. So this is um, as um, changes in suicide, um, and you know, non-Hispanic white women in particular are 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 really um, there's a big issue with suicide in that group as well as in men. And you know, people have called these the um, disease. This is a you know sort of deaths of um, of um, uh, from from opioids and um, um, from despair. Um, but you see that among um, women, um, the second highest group of suicide rates is among Asian women. And you don't see that among men. So, you know, again, I think, you know, we as Asians um, are, um, are becoming more like our, our US insular US group, um, then uh, it, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to make these big changes. Thank you for that. And thank you for bridging sort of our discussion really about um, gender, but also about health. And so one of the things I want to move on to um, is, is really sort of thinking about, uh, well, is sort of thinking about our positionality now with the sort of the transgenerational response to this anti-Asian um, um, violence. And so what we've seen, at least in Oakland and throughout California, as we're seeing um, not just a response to the police, right? So not just reaching out to the police, but communities are organizing. And, you know, how do we make sense of Asians with attitude who are patrolling Chinatown? Um, you know, so how do we, uh, how do we understand this new generation's response to um, the violence? that's ongoing. And perhaps we'll talk with, we'll start with um, you, Yale, perhaps because you've been um, dealing with a lot of graduate students, but also um, some of our young people at UH who are part of um, Asian American studies. Don't forget to unmute. Uh, so we can see that everywhere uh, in many cities of states, uh, so people, Asian American uh, groups so with so many ethnic groups together demonstrate, you know, against uh, anti-Asian hatred, discrimination. So this coalition fighting, united fighting, really help us to, to discuss the issue and move our issues to the center of national dialogue. That's a great. Uh, we also can, because I think the most important, uh, we need to organize a lot of research, use our data to show that the stereotypes, the bias, the, the discriminations to educate our public. Uh, I'm so happy to see uh, our Houston Asian American communities, uh, like uh, Debbie discussed uh, her organizations and Chinese community centers uh, organize a lot of activities. And together with our center, we all 
you know, slogan is we are not the problem. We are not the virus. We are the solutions because we organize a lot of uh, activities to uh, raise the money to uh, salute to first online heroes to help those people who are in financial need and to organize a lot of uh, education webinar to talk about the issues. So this is kind of activity we need to do because in order to eliminate discrimination, in order to create this hate-free society, we need to speak up. We speak out. We need to address the issues. We need to present what a history, you know, US history deeply rooted in this racist uh, discrimination. So uh, if we don't educate public, public, who will do that? So that's why I think it's our collective responsibility to do something to talk, to do research, to organize activities, to educate the public, and to create this hatred-free, harmonious society. We should work together, stand together with many ethnic organizations, with Americans together to create this discrimination-free society. This. Thank you so much. Thank Debbie, you. would you like to weigh in? I agree with you know everything that Dr. Zoe has said, right? Um, the, the, the thing that I would add to that is you know when I get a lot of questions from people like, well, what can I do? How can I help? Right. And and the first things that everyone's you know talking about right now is you know you know, intervene, right? Get yourself trained to, to be comfortable to intervene, um, you know, and, and to speak up. Uh, if you see something, you know, happening, speak up. Uh, make sure that, you know, the, the person who's, the, who's being victimized um, knows that you're there to support them, that, that they're not alone, right? That, that actually goes a long way towards uh, someone's mental health is to not feel that they are alone and no one cares. Um, the other thing would be, you know, to, you know, definitely report it, right? Regardless of whether you think anything's going to be done, we need to actually report it and, and document it, you know, to be able to, to, to say that there is a problem that needs to be addressed if it's not being reported um, or in tracked. But the, the last thing I would really emphasize everyone is and this is cuts across all communities, right? Is that everyone needs to step up and be a more, you know, active, civically engaged citizen. And especially in the AAPI community, because a lot of, you know, Houston especially is majority first generation immigrants, right? So you're talking about an entire population of people who don't necessarily come from countries where it's okay to actually go vote safely um, or to even be able to vote uh, or to call the police, right? Uh, and, and not have this fear that in the middle of the night, someone's gonna come and haul you off to God knows where, uh, you know, that it's safe to do that, to, to vote and to report. But most importantly, to register and, and vote because ultimately, whether it is, you know, money resources to, you know, communities for mental health or, you know, community education or for law enforcement support, like all of that comes down to policymakers, you know, and if our policymakers, our leaders in Congress, you know, and the Senate, if they don't fundamentally believe or demonstrate by their actions that they believe you know, minorities and Asian Americans are equal citizens and human beings in this country. And I, I use that specific language because last year, you know, Representative Grace Meng from New York put forth a resolution. And this was just a resolution, like a public statement, right? 
just asking for people, our leadership, to make a public statement that hate crimes against Asian Americans, scapegoating of a Asian Americans is wrong. It wasn't involving any money, wasn't involving any policy, right? This has nothing to do with partisanship, has nothing to do with politics. It is simply a statement saying Asian Americans are equal human beings and valued citizens in this country and should not be targeted. And 164 of our leaders in this country did not vote to say yes. Yes, Asian Americans should not be you know, targeted. Asian Americans should not be scapegoated. So that raises the question fundamentally of, do Asian Americans actually have power or are, are viewed as having a voice and a say and a seat at the table in any table to actually be able to determine what policies and what kind of influences there are going to be when it comes to issues that are going to impact our community. And hate crimes, right, cutting across the Asian community, all minority communities who suffer from discrimination should, should be able to feel that they are valued as equal citizens. And so I say to you know everyone who I talk with is yes, Support community organizations, give them money to support doing you know, bystander trainings and doing community education. But the, before you even put your money where your mouth is, go and register yourself to vote and then actually go vote. Vote for the people who are actually going to care about Asian Americans in this country when they're thinking about policies that are going to impact us. Thank you so much. You are so right. We need to hold people accountable and we need to report. And Professor um, Feng, right here from UH, did so some years back. You all can find a link to her article in which she had a disturbing exchange via voicemail from someone else. Um, actually, just really a model of how close and near this kind of violence, microaggression is to all of us. Yes, yeah, so absolutely report and vote. And I think to that end, this notion um, that Yali was raising about coalition building and working together speaks to a question that was brought up by our audience members. And the question is, um, is the Asian American community working together, um, though they come from various backgrounds? There are different members of, of the leadership of different organizations. I can at least say for the organizations that are more civically engaged, we have a coalition or a collaboration called Empowering Communities Initiative, ECI, where different organizations from representing different ethnic Asian backgrounds. We work together on a regular basis to try and encourage everyone to register and go vote or get their citizenship and to serve as a space. Like last year, we were very, very involved with you know, making sure everybody gets counted for the census. And then this year we're working together you know, on hate crimes awareness, on you know, food distributions for you know, people who suffer from the power outages of you know, Winter Storm Uri, as well as on redistricting, right? And, and ultimately our goal collectively is we want Asian Americans to be represented at every table, to have a seat at every table and to not be there just as the token yellow face, right? But to actually have someone there who understands the needs of our community and who are going to speak you know, and represent us well in a way that is engaging and recognizes the intersectionality of our communities and people who are lower income and limited English proficient. Follow-up question is, are Asian Americans working together with other communities of color to combat racism together? Absolutely. Uh, this is the one thing I say to everyone. A lot of times you do not see as many Asian Americans at some of these community tables because they're held during work hours. And in the entire city of Houston, there's literally a handful of organizations who had paid staff. And, and a couple of those are paid staffs of one. And so a lot of times they're not able to go to every single community meeting. But several of us who are in this coalition, for example, are part of the Houston Coalition Against Hate. We were there as a part of its establishment. We plan to be there in perpetuity. Um, and right now we actually you know, are partnering with them to offer bystander trainings every month 
So you can go to you know, Houston Coalition Against Hate's website to see that uh, OCA is also providing uh, additional uh, situational awareness trainings that will begin in the Houston area uh, in September as immediately after the bystander trainings are, are completed in that series. But um, you know, I think a lot of people were in our community were extremely moved last year you know, after George Floyd was murdered. Right. And the subsequent, you know, highlighting of other people who have, you know, experienced that, you know, and their families are having to, to deal with the aftermath of having a family member who was murdered. Um, I can say that for myself personally, for OCA Greater Houston, you know, for the first march that was organized by Black Lives Matter, we were there and we were able to support with, you know, 2000 you know, face masks and hand sanitizers and just with the limited resources that we had, we wanted to share that, right? Um, I hope that all of our community continues to do that. I know that with Dr. Yali Zo, what she referred to, there was a, an effort by us, by the Asian American community last year, to, we raised $160,000 to supply meals um, to frontline workers. And we made a, con a conscious, deliberate effort to target hospitals and clinics and grocery stores where we knew minority communities go to those establishments, right? And you know, minority communities are the people who work in those establishments. And so we wanted to, to very visibly demonstrate, you know, a lot of the work that frankly, that whole coalition came together because we knew all these different groups were donating stuff, donating PPP or donate PPE, um, but not really talking about it, right? So we were like, let's come together and try to, you know, distribute this stuff and at least let people know that the Asian American community is just as invested as everyone else's. No, thank you. I actually want to take us, we're running out of time. There's so many great questions here from our audience members. And some of them want a bit more context in, in terms of historicizing a few points that you, may, you all have made earlier. So one of the questions, this is a very large question, so, but I ask you to be very brief in your answer um, because I imagine and I hope that this is the first of many conversations that we will have. We cannot just relegate these conversations to be an urgent response to a shooting. They need to be ongoing and multifaceted. So the question is, um, can you please discuss the history of US militarism across Asia since the colonization of the Philippines in 1898 and war warfare slash occupation, this is including spaces like Japan, Korea, Vietnam, to examine the material and practical links between US imperialism and the sexual exploitation of Asian women. Let's have it. Some, <laughs> any one of you all can, can weigh in. I imagine, um, Debbie, we have we have uh, belabored you quite a bit. Um, <laughs> so, any one of you all can jump in. Well, I feel that we. I sort of answered that already when I was talking about the films in the mid-century films and the ways in which they were romanticizing American foreign policy and the sort of like uh, post-war like notions of of Asia and Asian women. So I don't know. Um, I mean, I can go into more media examples, but I mean, I think basically in summary, right? I mean, the Philippines is, is longer because it goes back to the 19th century and it has more to do with labor and ter 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 territorial interests. I mean, it precedes communism and, and the world wars. So, I mean, it's a little bit different. I mean, and, and the Philippines is like the sort of historical case that everyone cites as an American imperialism, like in the sort of comparable to the British or French context where, where, it, lo where it looks like a colo settler colonialism. Them, right, rather than just kind of a foreign policy, uh, sort of, um, I forget the Cold War term, like beachhead. Um, but certainly by mid-century, by the, by the 20th century, right, America's military and foreign policy interests in the Asia Pacific region, right, are primarily oriented towards sort of Amer maintaining American interests, right, which is capitalism, 
right? And so it's sort of like contain, it's a strategy of containment against communism. So Asia becomes this vulnerable site in the eyes of the US um, state because China has, China, which is this powerful country has turned communist. And so they're afraid that the rest of the the, the countries, the, the non-aligned countries are going to fall in the under under the influence of China. And so American foreign spending and military interest like stays and, and mounts in the Asia Pacific region, region, region for that for that reason. Um, and so America continues to have this sort of like direct experiential relationship with Asia on the part of its servicemen and the people, um, the foreign policy workers, right? And then it also becomes visible to Americans at home, as I've said, through this sort of mass cultural media, like Hollywood movies. Okay, thank you so much for adding to that, um, especially with the context of the Philippines. And I just wanna add, as we're talking about coalition building, you know, the Philippines was this one site in which you had African-American soldiers defect from the US Army and support um, these means. And I think oftentimes we just do not um, bring this into our history books. We do not discuss it in class. And so there is this kind of notion of the division between all these various groups of people who at various points have worked together. But I will um, actually push, push forth and ask this other question just as a representation of of our audience members who are here and want to engage with you all as best they can. And I think this will be our last question as we get um, to the close of this discussion today. But what do you see as the relationship between the first legislative act, the Page Act of 1875, which was aimed at Chinese women to stop immigration for the purposes of stopping quote, immoral behavior, end quote. The relationship between the Page Act and now? Um, yes, and, and for the, specifically for the purposes of stopping um, immoral behavior. You know, so how can we maybe under, it, it might help us tease out this notion of um, a sexualized um, Asian woman that we had been discussing earlier on. Professor Zhou, do you want to take that or? Nothing in that field. <laughs> okay. So the Page Act, I mean, first of all, the Page Act precedes the Exclusion Act of 1882, but it was not the first anti-Asian law that the US government passed. Like there were a series of laws preceding the Page Act. So I mean, I can't remember the various, like the um, the various, the exact names or the exact dates, but you know, there were already laws, you know, restricting, like, you know, in, imposing requirements, restricting, uh, you know, uh, imposing requirements of literacy and capital like, you know, re re restricting them from owning land, or owning property, testifying in court, te testifying, you know, like mandating habeas corpus, like, um, you know, uh, considering th their death equal to the death of a white person or even a slave, right? Like, I mean, there were a number of legal instances like prior to Page. So Page is, you, the best way to think of Page, Page's, Page's movement was to legislate or to restrict the, the, the arrival of female Asian, female Asian bodies, but it was only one of a series of acts, right, which is part of the America's overall history of exclusion against Asian bodies, right, and so, but the Page Act is particularly important, right, because it, 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 it again sort of goes back to what we were saying about the particular, the, the particularity of the female body in anti-Asian racism, as, you know, when we, when we talk about the intersection of race and gender, if African Americans like are particularly represented, as I said earlier, through the power and the vulnerability of the male body, like the sort of the stereotype of the of Asian race, you know, in in the white American Western historical consciousness is of like the sexual body of the Asian woman. Right, and so, and, and we talked again about like why that is because of the brothels, because you know, um, in, in the Chinatown brothels going all the way up to mid-century American military and foreign policy interests. And so the Page Act like is one of these series of exclusion laws, but the one that most dramatically tries to enact exclusion through by regulating the, the dangerous and seductive Asian, the female Asian body. Thank you to all of you all for taking us both near and far in our understanding of a very complex issue. I do lie, I have one last question, which is what is our way forward? 
you know, I can't just leave this um, forum having put out with you all the major issues at play, at least for this moment. But what do we do? You know, we have this forum, we have this discussion, we have you all as experts, but what can we do as we leave this meeting? I would say a couple things, right? One, if, if you are a citizen, register yourself to vote. If you have a green card for five years, get your citizenship and, and then register to vote. Um, support Asian American organizations that are doing this type of work because frankly, they're, most Asian American organizations are under-resourced. And there's a reason why there's only, you know, literally a handful of organizations that have staff. You know, we don't get the same kind of support from even across foundations in this country. Like we, we literally get, the last statistic I know of was we get less than four tenths of 1% of all foundation money in this country, right? We don't, we don't even get 1%, we're, we're four, four tenths of a percent. Um, but for those of us in Texas, long-term, right? One of the things that we ought to really consider is, you know, one of the projects that OCA is working on is looking at having AAPI curriculum adopted by the State Board of Education. And, and we are, you know, essentially copying what the Latinx and the African-American communities have done. But the step beyond that of once you have these type of ethnic studies you know, curriculum available is to actually have teeth in it because right now it is just an elective and it's not considered, it's not mandatory. There's no mandate that every student in, in the state should take some kind of multicultural ethnic type of studies course as a high school student. And they're not, those courses are not classified as high enough in the, so if you're, if you're a student and you're concerned about your GPA, for instance, are you going to take a class that's gonna give you a 6.0 or are you gonna take a class that's gonna be a 4.0 if you have all those ranges of electives, right? Um, some people will look at that. But the other bigger issue is Texas is the second biggest market for history books, social studies books after California. So we should be looking at, you know, and the Texas Board of Education, um, when these books are being designed, what is actually included in it, right? Because if we were to say in Texas, to make sure that our history books here and social study books have the inclusion of minority communities in those textbooks, our histories and our contributions, then because we are such a large market, that will basically mandate what textbooks get sold in the rest of the country because publishers make a business decision to use the textbooks that are through Texas and through California because of you know, financial reasons, right? They're not gonna print multiple versions of the same book. So that is something I would encourage people to really think about is how do we educate our future generations? That I believe and hope would really go a long ways towards you know, eradicating hate and everybody actually valuing the contributions of our diversity you know, here in America. Yeah, I support you. Excellent statement. I think uh, after the discussion, our conclusion is that racism, sexism is a power, is a virus that really poison our mind and destroy our unity of the country. So what do we need to do? We stand together. We speak out anti-Asian discrimination or hatred. We go out to vote and we need to change our curriculum, our history education. Asian American history, it's a part of nation history. Our na narrative stories need to be heard. 
if you don't put their in history textbook, but the history textbooks to represent the Asian from hegemonic ideology uh, perspective, we need to use our own story to teach what is Asian American history. So in a summary, we need to address the issue. We need to take access. What action engage community activities, doing research, pers persuade public to work together and uh, make racist, sexy, free society. This I want to say. Thank you. Liz, do you want to say anything? Are you going to say anything about health? Well, I mean, um, you know, to be aspirational, again, the idea of, of trying to be, you know, um, at, we all learn from each other. That trans, I, I was really struck when you said about transnationalism and really trying to bring a transnational approach to health to the US and, you know, a, trans, a global uh, vision. And it starts with education, it starts with um, diversifying our workforce. It to start. It starts with unity. And so, I. It's not specific. There's no. I'm not. You know. I agree with everything that Debbie and Dr. and Yali have said. So already. You know. We have to. You know. Do what we can locally. Right. Think locally. Act globally. Or think. Think. Act locally. Think globally. So what we do in our own communities is to. You know. Um, reach out and and work with um, the members of our community. Um, and we hope that the, we can bring a better um, perspective to the community that will, you know, reverberate into the larger dialogue. Yeah, I wanted to say, um, you know, even though the reason that we're all speaking today is, first of all, the terrible tragedy in Atlanta, and then generally this huge upswing in terrible acts against Asian Americans, like from, you know, other kinds of assault to just sort of verbal assault, right? Like this is the main reason for our conversation today. The thing that I want, want to leave people to think about in ways that they can help is to think about microaggressions because it, there's actually a direct line, you know, from microaggressions, like very small, like slurs or, you know, seemingly like off color comments, you know, or just like, you know, um, praise, you know, like, stereotypes that are couched like praise, like the, you know, model minority thing, like that there's a direct relationship between something, between microaggressions and, you know, terrible acts like the Atlanta shooting. And so, you know, for, for everyone, whether you're Asian American or, you know, someone who wants to be an ally, I think we need to think about more often about like these very mild things, you know, one of the reasons why the sexualization of, and objectification of, of Asian American women has gone by unremarked for so long or unremarked outside of the Asian American community, right? Is because in some level it's supposed to be seen as pop, you know, positive, like you're desirable. You know, um, with the rise of online dating, Asian American women were the single most desirable group, <laughs> like from among all races. So, like, so, you know, so. Um, so, you know, to, to we need to be more self-aware of the ways in which like any kind of thing can can um, enable and perpetuate a, a perception, a, you know, a, a objectifying and uh, uh, disrespectful and mis, you know, unba unbase, uh, baseless representation, ba baseless understanding of of a of a person or a population or, or a gender or race. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. I want to give a special thank you to Professor Yali So, um, Professor Karen Fang, as well as Dr. Liz Yu Chow and Debbie Chen. I want to just alert you to a couple of things in your chat. Should you want to connect with Asian American studies, you should have the information available for you. We urge you to do that, whether it's simply just joining a listserv, um, please do so. As well as if you want to support the efforts of OCA Greater Houston, the information is also in the chat as well. I wanna thank you again for your time and your attention. I hope that we will meet again in person 
um, and some version so that we can actually feel all of the things that are connected to this. It's not simply just research. These are lives and they matter. Now I'm turning it over to Professor Gregory for her close. Thank you, Shepa. Uh, and thank you all of the wonderful panelists. Uh, there's so much to talk about. Um, and clearly talking about it is part of the way forward, right? Just having these conversations and raising all the points that people were raising uh, is essential. And just a note back to what you were noting, Debbie, about textbooks, textbooks are political in Texas. Uh, you know, uh, what you were saying makes absolute sense, but the reason that people are not represented there is because people have made choices not to do that, right? So diversity is here, but our legislatures legislators need to hear from the people that we that we need to be represented and that we want to see all groups represented there. Um, otherwise, it won't happen, even though it makes perfect sense that it should. Uh, same, I will say, is true of women's studies, uh, uh, right? People don't want to talk about gender, or some people don't. Um, but it's, uh, it's key to, uh, and it's something that all young people really want to know about, right? Uh, so race and gender uh, and the intersectionalities of that are essential to, for textbooks. I agree. And I wanted to let people know that we have two talks upcoming in April that we hope you'll join us for. On the 15th, we'll have the next talk in the class race and social justice series. And our speaker will be Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore. We'll be talking about racial capitalism and that's at 3 p.m. And on April 23rd, we will welcome back UH, former UH WGSS postdoc, Dr. Sarah Luna, who will give a talk about her book, new book entitled Love in the Drug War, Selling Sex and Finding Jesus on the US-Mexico Border. So please go to our website and look for details on those. And again, thank you very much to all those in the audience who've attended and to our panelists uh, for all the good work that you do and to our moderator uh, and hope to see you soon continuing the conversation. Bye-bye.